Okay, continue with the OS dev again. I have some fixes and things that we can go over and other things that need fixed that we can do and we'll go from there. <laughs> so the first thing today, I wanted to debug printf to see why it does not print the final byte in some strings. I did find out why that is, so I'll go over that here along with these, well, that is what these new lines are for effectively. So let me go into, I guess, standard IO because I did a little bit with that. Not very much, but a little bit. Okay, so for the right buffer, it wasn't initialized before. I had some issues where I was messing with printing things out and it was printing extra characters or weird random crap to the screen effectively. So if I just initialize the buffer to zero, since I don't have a C allocate, that's what I have to do right now. I should make a C allocate one of these days. Um, I'm just initializing the right buffer to zero whenever we're getting a malloc buffer here. So I'm also doing it here when we double the size just in case. And then mem setting that. Yeah, and then copying it in. Yep, that's all that's doing in here. And the sys calls, what am I doing? So I had issues with the right system call that was ignoring the flags, which I didn't notice because I guess I was tired. <laughs> I was tired, but so the write and read sys call I changed a little bit. It may have only been in write here, but I'm just checking if it's not read only, uh, or if it is read only. I'm checking if it's not write only or read write, then it would be read only, and we can't write to a file that's read only, so that'll have an error. So that is that. Before it was just checking if and read only, and read only is defined as zero in an enum, so if anything anded with zero, that would be zero. And if zero is not true, so this would never pass an error for read only. So I'll, I just changed it to be if not write only and not read write. There's probably better ways to do that check, but that's fine. That works there. I'm not sure if I can do a similar one in read or not. I just have if it's if the write only flag is set, <laughs> which I think is all we need. Otherwise, it would be read only or read write. So I think read is okay with just this flag check. But yeah, that was an issue there. So then let's see in the kernel. In the kernel, when I'm doing that new type command, TYPE, to type out a text file to screen, um, I also added a check if the FD was not open. I'm not going to be able to write standard in, out, or error effectively later on, so I'm just preventing that from happening here by saying we at least have a file to run here at an FD of three or above. Okay, so in the test write this call, I changed to open it since I made the check to check uh, if it's not read only. I'm also adding the flag here for write only to the open flags. I'm doing that, and on the test read call, I'm adding read write instead of read only because I'm going to be writing to it down here to check if I read the data properly. Yeah, so I write to it and then I check if I read it. So I'm going to use the read write flag for that. Okay. So my issue, which I guess I don't have with the new tag, which I should have, but that's all right. My issue that I remember is in string and uh, mem copy at the bottom. Oh, I do have a tag here. Okay. <laughs> uh, my issue was the i. The i value here is the index from the start of the source and desk buffers to copy the right characters over. I did change this to be length over four for 32 bits or four bytes at a time, and it does work. But then after that point, I just had four i less than length mod four i plus plus. I could have been some value that's greater than three, and this would never have, the loop would never have ran. So if we have a, a string that's, you know, hello world, that's 13, yeah, that's 13 characters long. But if we go four characters at a time, it would be 13 over four that that many times this loop would run. And 13 over four is three, remainder one. So I effectively would be three at this point. Length over four in this case would be, would be three. So I would go zero, one, two. So it, I guess it might even be two. And then if we just have I less than length mod four, well, we're only going up to one here for the remainder from the modulo. Uh, if I was two or greater, this loop would never have ran. So that is why it was skipping this ending exclamation mark and not printing it out. It was only going up to 12 from this loop. It was not getting the extra 113 from this loop. 
So to fix that, I actually copy the final bytes here. Instead of doing this, uh, multiplying by four to get to the right singular byte offset in the buffer. So this would be, you know, 12 in this case for that hello world string. And then to get the final exclamation mark character 13, I'm just saying if we have any characters left to zero, one, two, or three for the remainder of length divided by four, then I'm gonna iterate through those with a, an extra J variable here. And I is going to be at the right position and it will still increment and we'll take one byte at a time. So that way it goes through, you know, that last exclamation point. And with those changes, it does actually work in print. And with the flag changes and things, uh, the tests all run correctly. It says, hey, we read the hello world string. If we try type on either write or read test, right now they have the same thing. So if we type out read test.txt, and we have hello world, and we have the, exc the exclamation point. So that actually all works now, which is nice. That's fixed. So I like that. This is done. It's always good when you can find bugs the next day after you wake up within like an hour. That, that always happens, but that's okay. So, all right. I also wanted to fix or, yeah, have work again. <laughs> Files being able to load and be executed from the file system, like the, ca the calculator or the editor, have programs work. So I figure I'm going to do that similar to how we're checking for text files and the type command. Where I'm going to load a program, I'll just say we'll check for .bin as the ending characters for a, a bin file. We'll open it, so we'll get an FD after we open it, and then we'll get an address to that. We'll get the address to where the file was loaded, which this is a pointer, so I may not need um, the, ex the extra ampersand there. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll just get a pointer, a function pointer to that address. We'll say we're going to pass in the argc, argv values like normal. And then we'll call it and get an int return code should it return one. So I'm assuming it will, but we'll see. So I'm hoping that'll work to just call the file. We don't have execute flags as part of the paging system. 64-bit paging does. It has an execute disable flag, I think is the top bit or something like that. 32-bit paging that I'm still in right now does not have that. So I would have to handle that myself. I, there are available bits within a page that we can use or we can otherwise handle in, you know, kernel or user logic later if we want to handle, like, write, XOR, execute for memory, we'll say. Um, I don't have a memory map system call or function or anything, so that might be something we can look at later. But, yeah. So let's see. If I go down below all the commands, my last one was command type, right? So it should be after this. We're checking the file name. This stuff is not going to work because we don't have that file table anymore. So I'm just going to do this, remove commented out code when ready. So we're not going to do that. We do kind of want to check that the file exists, but that will be there in argv0. That will be what they type in. So we'll have to get the stuff here, I suppose. We'll have to get the inode first. So we'll check if file exists. I guess we'll open it, and then we'll get the size, and we'll try to run it if it's a bin file. So let's do that first. Check if file is a bin file, but I want to write what actually, what are we doing here? So assuming user did not type in a command, but a program to run. First, check if file is a bin file. So we'll do that first. Assuming it is, we'll open the file, and then we'll do this stuff down here. So let's do that. I want to compare, similar how I did up here, so I'll do that. We'll just string compare argv0 with string length argv0 minus 4, checking for bin. So the file that they typed in would be the first token in the command string. So if they typed in and they wanted to run the editor, We'd have a, a prompt here, we'll say it's this, and they would type in, or the calculator, calculator.bin. So this would be an argv0. If they called it with something, say like an expression that we can add later, one plus five or so, then that would be argv1, but argv0 is gonna be this. So the string length minus, um, well, string length would be one based, so it'd be minus one, two, three, four, as the pointer that we're checking against for dot bin. In this case, that would be true, it would go on, if it was like text, that would not be true. We'll print an error and continue there. So we'll say file is not a bin file. 
cannot run, we'll say cannot run program, file is not a bin file. Okay. Other than that, we'll open, so lay int we'll say int32, we'll say program fd, and let's have that be open for argv0. And that should assume it's going to be in the current file path. It'll make the file if it doesn't exist. But I can check if it exists or not with checking the open file table entry stuff, I think. We could check the size and bytes. If the size and bytes is zero, it doesn't exist, and I'm not going to run it. So let me add the check. Add that check here. Check if this is a new file or not. Uh, don't run a newly created file. We could also call something in the file system like get inode from path and check if it exists instead of opening it first. That might be better, actually. Let's um, let's do that because I should have the file system, yeah, implemented right there. Let's do that. That would be inode from path. So let's say program inode. That'll equal inode from path argv0. We'll say inode t, it's an inode t program inode, okay. So if it's zero, or if the, if the inode returns like an empty inode, stuff within that would be zero, so I'll check if the id is zero, it means it doesn't exist. So if program inode id is zero, we know the file didn't exist. So if they typed in, you know, if they typed in uh, bumpkiss.bin and that doesn't exist, we want to error on that. So cannot run program file does not exist. Yeah. Or just say, we'll say program does not exist. Program s does not exist. There we go. Okay, otherwise we know it does exist, so we'll open it. We'll get a program FD here. So we'll open that. I guess with read or write, it doesn't really matter what permissions we do. We won't need create. We're not going to make it, but we could do. Right now, we'll just say read only, although it'll also have execute privileges. We'll say read only. And we want to get how large it is. This comes from things like seek, so we could do that. Since we don't have access to like a file pointer that holds the size or anything, I don't have a structure for that. So to get the amount of pages, well, it's already actually, it's already going to be allocated to the address in the open file table with the, with the size that it is at this point. Open handles that. So actually, we don't have to worry about this stuff. I mean, I could print it out for debugging purposes, but right now I don't, I don't really need this. The entry point. It's not really going to be at that entry point. It'll be wherever it's loaded. I'm not going to worry. It'll be at the next available virtual address, which is just right now effectively a bump allocator. I really should change that to have like a virtual address map that we pick from, but oh well. That'll be later on, I'm sure. Allocated map. It's already been mapped. We don't have to worry about this stuff. So to be able to call it, I'm not going to worry about this because it will already have been loaded within open. So I actually have a lot easier implementation now. Open handles a lot of stuff for me. Check the file extension. I'm assuming it's been at this point. Text files, I'm saying, hey, we can use the type command or something to run. So I could set up malloc, though. But we know this is going to be true. So I shouldn't have to do that. And I'm going to clean this up in a bit. I'm just trying to, you know, test it first. So let's say before we run, I'm going to reset the malloc things. It won't be the entry point. We'll set it to a different virtual address. We need to set it to after where the file is loaded, I guess, at this point. We could set it to a generic entry point, but we could set it to, we need a pointer to the file table entry to know where it's loaded. Let me get that as well. So open file table T will have program file table entry or something, and that'll be open, file table plus FD. So we can do that. And instead of the entry point, 
and we get the program file table entry, the reference to get the address, and then we'll add, well, I don't know how big it was. <laughs> we can set it like right after where the offset is. The program shouldn't load more than its memory. I mean, it might malloc stuff or open stuff in memory and things, but it shouldn't add to like where its own address is located. A program's not gonna expand itself. Although I guess it could. Yeah, virtual address map would help here because I could just say get next address from the map and use that as needed. That would be good, but I don't have that. So um, to closely follow what we had before, I'm just gonna put it after where the file is loaded in memory. So we'll say right at the end, we'll say plus it's offset. Really bad way of doing this, by the way. <laughs> Change this. Uh, Let's do it up here. Change this, possibly using a virtual address map to get the next available. Yeah, we'll say next available virtual address. Because this is a bad way of doing this. But that's okay. And function pointer, we can do this, I think. Except it won't be void. I'll just say it's a function pointer to jump to and execute code. So we have an int pointer to some function, a function, some function that returns an int that we're passing an argument count and an argument vector to. Instead of entry point, it's going to be the address that it was loaded to, which is going to be here. And we'll pass it the argc and argv values gotten earlier. This can return. Yeah, we'll execute that code, and then after it returns, assuming it does, I want a return code probably. Let's set this up differently. Let's do int pointer, we'll say program. We'll do int argc, character argv. We'll just have a generic thing here, right? And that will equal this. Separate it out a little bit. That'll be a pointer to this address, and this is a UN8T, this address. So that being a pointer, this should be okay. If it doesn't like it, then I can cast it, that's okay. So assuming we have that, we'll have an int. I'll make this 32T just in case. We'll have an int return code, and that will equal running the program. So we'll say program, we'll pass it argc and argv. We'll say if, uh, how do we know if it's an error? I'll say we return something negative. So if it's less than zero, then we'll print that out. So it'll say error running program. Right now we'll just say whatever the return code was. Just in case, just as a like a, a catch all thing right there. If we use malloc, we want to free it up. Malloc virtual address, yep. Then we'll do that. that. That all should work similarly. It should be okay. If you're using a back buffer, we want to do that. We'll clear the screen after it's done, or we don't really have to. But yeah, I don't have restoring screen data, so I will clear it just for a given known state of everything being empty. We know we freed pages. But that's okay. I'll comment that out actually. Um, no, we do want to free. Yeah, we'll free the pages, but I'm just going to say we don't need to look at that. And then we'll continue with the prompt at that point. Printing a text file to the screen. I have it behind a command now, so I don't have to do this. So just commenting all these out. We'll remove it. The kernel will be simplified. We don't have to worry about this right now. That's okay. That's printing the memory map. All right, so we can try and see if this works. It probably won't. Because nothing ever does, either from compile errors or other things. FD is undeclared, that's true. program FD, but if I want to be consistent with naming, let's do PGM. 
Assignment to UN32 from un 8 pointer, that's true. Malloc virtual address, that is true. So the malloc address, where's that at down here? Right here. So this is a UN8T and on the side, so let's encapsulate all of that, and then we'll cast that. <laughs> Just cast the problem away, that's all right. Initialization, initialization of int32t pointer from incompatible pointer type uint8t. Okay, so I know what I want to do, but this is not a void pointer. It's a uint8t. I don't think just getting that will work, right? No. So I have to do that. Okay, that's okay. It, it's going to look very ugly, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, 32t pointer type of an int and character pointer for this. Yeah, it'll look ugly, but that's okay. Vert equals entry point. Yes, I don't have the entry point anymore. That's true. This is when I'm freeing the memory. So where am I allocating? This is allocating for malloc. So I need to start it from wherever malloc's starting from, which is here. So let's do that. Because that's where I need to free the memory from if I'm malloc-ing it. Yeah. I'm mallocking it. Where did that happen? 813. Down here, this entry point. Okay. Free remaining memory. I'm freeing the page. I'm resetting malloc. Then I'm freeing the page again. Why am I doing this twice? Is there a reason I'm doing this twice? I don't remember what the reason would be. <laughs> this is at the original one and at the, oh, whatever. I'm not gonna worry about it, I guess. I probably should. I don't know why I'm doing that twice. Let me put a note here. Why am I doing this twice is memory not freed above. That's, this is the malloc address, which is here. And this would be from the entry point. I think this is for the program itself, which I should do close and close would do that. So I'm doing it from the entry point. That's where the program is at. If this is freeing the program's memory, then can use close instead. I think that's what's going on here. Let me just remove that and then put that back. I think that's what's going on here. I'm freeing from the entry point. Originally, I didn't do that because it was a bin or a text file, and I wanted to free the memory that was allocated for the program. So I think instead of this, I can just call close, because close should handle that. Free up program memory and remove from file table. We'll do that. So we'll call close on program FD. That should be all right. I'll get rid of more compilers because there's less code. Needed pages I don't need anymore. We'll remove that. Program not loaded is unused. That's true. And file bin and index. So a lot of stuff we're not using, which is good. IDX this. Less code is always good. It's good to remove stuff when possible. So let's see what we have here. So I doubt th I doubt stuff's going to work. I might immediately get a page fault and have to, you know, run down where the error is happening. But if we just put calculator.bin, nothing really happens, which is probably not great. 
Might be an infinite loop. Might be something else. <laughs> I mean, we did run to and execute where it's loaded. But I'm kind of getting nothing here. Did I reach like a halt or something? So EAX is zero. So we reached like a halting point somewhere. Okay. Which is good to know, kind of. I mean, it's not good that it halted, but it's kind of good to know. That would be where the program was loaded to, to the address. We would get a return code. Maybe it doesn't return a return code. Let's see if we get after this point. Right quick, and then I'll check out what the calculator is actually doing. Maybe there's an issue in there, which there probably could be. But we didn't get a page fault, which is interesting. And we didn't get these errors, so I know it should have at least gotten to this point. I feel like calling it here is what's wrong. But we'll find out. We'll just put in our own halt. Let's say, put in dead beef. And we'll just check that we got some sentinel value. Another sentinel value, just to prove that we got here. If those are both true, then we know we got to this point. Just make that here. All right. Calculator.bin. Did we get to that point? No, we didn't. Okay, so it's stuck probably within the calculator, just to be doubly sure that's where it's at. Let's put this before this point. Click outside of there. Info registers. Yep, we're getting to that point. Okay, that's good. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. So let's see, is it something obvious that's in the calculator maybe? It could be. I mean, what am I actually doing here? Calc entry, clearing the screen. It's not even getting to clear the screen, so that's not good first off. It could be where it's calling malloc if it's doing that somewhere in here, I'm not sure. Get line of input, cursor on. It should enable the cursor, it should get a key. Check if what we entered was valid. If not, we'll go on. So it should at least enable the cursor. It should at least clear the screen, and it's not doing that either. I know that's not right. So is it even getting to this point? I guess we can find out. Is it getting like before the clear screen? Is it even getting here? I'll just put this as the start in here have different sentinel values. And we know it's in the file system because we see it. We have calculator.bin, it picks it up. Oh, I can't use the, uh, <laughs> the thing here, so let me not do that. Control G, this, okay. Let's not do that. Okay, so it does get to that point in the calculator. Okay, that's good to know. Does it get after clear screen? Because that should clear the screen, and I suppose it's not. Could be an issue with some of these things included or using different variables and things that are being shadowed. Not absolutely sure. Oh, debugging. Okay, it reaches that point. It's not clearing the screen though. So what would be the issue there? It's entering a loop. Possibly we're getting input and it's working somewhat correctly. It's just not printing anything out. That could be it. Which would be interesting, but that could be it. It's not clearing the screen, I know that. We have green cursor included. Uh, which isn't that. That's the cursor stuff. We have screen clear screen. 
obviously that's what's clearing the screen. So I'm just writing to the terminal that does terminal right. I mean, that works normally. So why wouldn't it be working here? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, CLS, like what are we actually doing here? I had some debugging for frame buffer stuff, <laughs> which I haven't gone over, but I wanted to make sure it worked first. And now I'm not really sure. I guess if we don't have the right graphics mode and the base pointer and everything, that would be an issue, could be an issue. Do have graphics.h, that should be at one central location. We could pass that stuff in. Maybe we could say this is not going to clear the screen and we could just use normal printf stuff so we could change the calculator to hopefully print to the same screen, which would probably be a little bit better to be fair. So we could see if that's working because right now I'm just calling like write for stuff, right? I'm not calling print. Well, I am calling printf. Well, we can check if that's working. So. Oh, I need to remove a lot of stuff. Okay. <laughs> Let's check if that's working. Printf calculator. Slash r slash n. Slash r slash n. Put that. We'll see if that even shows up on the screen. You know, does a printf call work? No, we get a page fault. Okay. And the address is above four is probably reasonable. So it could be something to do with uh, with malloc, with printf, with that kind of stuff. That would be true, because that's not working there. And we call malloc within printf, so I feel like it's probably an issue with malloc. Wherever my kernel stuff is at, where I'm setting this up, I'm saying, hey, it's right after the address, plus this. Like, that's not really good, probably. What I could do instead is maybe set something else. Let's do it at the next available. Well, let me just comment that out. Uh, get rid of that for now. So the malloc virtual address, we'll set this at the next available virtual address, which I don't have in here. I don't remember where I had that. <laughs> Uh, next available virtual address. It may only be in the other file. I really don't have that. I know I called it something like that. Next available file virtual address. That's what I called. That's in syscalls. That should be in the kernel. Yeah, file virtual address. Okay. And let's just copy that and we'll plus equal the page size because we're using that right now. This is not a great way of doing it, but that's what I'm doing. Just to make sure that's not a malloc issue with calling this. Still doesn't print anything, but I don't know. Where, where did we get? <laughs> We're getting, we're getting past the printf. So the printf line is not doing anything. That's interesting. It might be printing something, but it just, we can't see it. Like that could be it. This is not great. I don't want to just be debugging for three hours because that's terrible viewing content, I think. But this doesn't work. So it's something with malloc or it's something with writing. And I kind of fixed malloc a little bit by setting it at a different address. So I feel like it's with writing in the right system call. So let's say wrappers, when we go to write, FD buffer in length, so it shouldn't be that, it should just be in the system call. And if they sent in standard out or error, which I have one, I freaking wrappers. I don't have that in here, do I? It's in numbers. Dang it.
I don't have it in there actually. I thought I had standard in, out, and error. Is that in my system calls file? I know I have that defined somewhere. I don't remember where that's defined. So I'm here. Where do I have that at? <laughs> I have it in standard IO. Okay, standard out is one and standard IO. I just wanted to make sure the number was right. Okay. Thank you, grep. I could call grep from here. I don't know why I'm not doing that. Grep is one, right calls with one standard IO. If I go to the bottom, I'm calling right to standard out. That should be one. Okay, if it's standard out, we call terminal right. Terminal right is this function. And if we're printing, what is the issue? Are, are these colors not correct? <laughs> are they not drawing anything? They're, they're both drawing the background or something? Maybe? I'm not really sure, to be fair. I could check by changing the colors and then writing with this. I might try that. Where's the calculator? Or I might just cut all this out of the video. I mean, you never know. It, it could work. If we do slash x1b, foreground number, background number, so let's say percent x, background, percent x, semicolon. So foreground color, let's make uh, white. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's fine. Background color, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll just make it a uh, white on black, right? Or we'll make it red. Red on black. Is it RGBA? It's ARGB, so it's ARGB. Hex escape sequence out of range, is it? Oh yeah, because X1B has that. Let's do 0, 3, 3, 3 times, 3 times 8, 24, plus 3, 27. That's the escape character. Okay. Just to refresh. It does not print anything. That's interesting. Okay, I have to find out why that's not, where it gets in an infinite loop. It's probably some pointer issue or some variables not being passed around right or something. Um, I'll be back when... I found out when I find out why that doesn't print anything. <laughs> so I'll be back. All right, I found and sort of fixed the issues here. It was, uh, it's pretty obvious things, but it took a while to track down and find exactly why, you know, the obvious things don't work sometimes. So let me just show uh, right quick that the stuff does work at the moment. And I'll say how I did it in a second. But if we run calculator, it should run similarly to how it did before. I might have to mess with cursor drawing since I'm not drawing anything. It doesn't really show up until I type something. But if we do like 1 plus 10 is 11, 100 minus 90 is 10, we can still return with escape or with control R. And that goes back to it. The editor technically boots, but it doesn't really run things because it's still using old things and assuming the file table and all. So it kind of breaks <laughs> if I save a new file. It's like editor test or something dot text and we leave, we can't do directory anymore. So, although I'm, I'm curious if that goes back. No, it just ruins it. So yeah, I'll have to change the editor, but I did get files to load again. And a big factor in that uh, is that um, on some changes recently, let me put these on their own lines actually. On some changes, you know, in the last few episodes or before, I changed from PIE to no PIE, so no position independent executable. Um, and what that means when an object, in this case, when a C program is, you know, compiled into an object file with the dot O and it's transformed into a binary here, the addresses contained within for strings and variables and things, uh, the addresses were relative offsets, I believe, at least for jumping around, and maybe some of the addresses were maybe like rip relative if it was 64 bit. In this case, it's 32 bit, but a string might've been at um, the current instruction pointer plus a hundred bytes, we'll say. Uh, with no PIE, it's not position independent and wherever the file is linked at, 
usually the OS has like a loader function or something where it fixes up the addresses when you actually run the program. In this case, I'm doing flat binaries because I do things the worst way. <laughs> and I don't have a, a linker and loader set up right in the OS when I load things. I don't have any object file format. It's a flat binary. So the addresses are not relative. The addresses are absolute. And whatever the file is linked at, which I'm using linker scripts to do, those are the addresses that are contained. So if I had static strings and things, they could have been at address 1000, at address 10,000, at address 427654 or something. And they weren't really mapped in right or pointers didn't correspond to the addresses correctly. It was, you know, a mess. So really what I'm doing with no PIE, since they're at absolute addressing, I'm going back to using a fixed entry point and not calling open or anything anymore. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. So if I look in the calculator in the editor files, uh, the old entry point I had was at four megabytes. So that's just what I did with this. I'm saying, hey, the file, I want to link the sections starting here and going up the text, data, RO data, VSS sections. And I'm going to start off those sections at four megabytes. And the text section will be first. And at the front of the text section, I'm going to have the entry point, which I put in its own section, calc entry. Um, if I could set, you know, an entry point here, uh, I would do so, but it didn't really work in the past. But anyway, we're linking these at a fixed entry point so that it works right now. Same thing for the editor. Just linking at the 4 meg entry point. So if I go to the kernel and do FD, is this the kernel? This is the kernel. So let's go to new, whatever new things I had. I was opening the file. I'm not going to call open anymore. I'm going to, I want to eventually, but maybe I, I probably want to have like some sort of linker and loader thing set up to fix up addresses and have actual file formats that aren't flat binaries for that to work. So until I have that, I probably can't do this, but um, I am going to get rid of some of this commented out code. But when I, when I ended up doing was still getting the needed pages. So I had that down here. I kind of uncommented, copied that up here. So instead of getting from the old file table where I just had an offset from a, a pointer, pretty much, this time I have the inode. I got the inode up here for the program. That inode, among other things, has the size of the file. So I'm taking the size in sectors times 512 for the size in bytes, which I could just do size in bytes, actually, now that I think about it. But anyway, the size in bytes and pages, I'm, I'm checking. So size in sectors times 512 to convert to bytes. And if there's a partial sector or partial page of data, I'm adding another page. So this is how much memory and pages that the program is going to take up. And I'm not doing this anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. I'm setting a fixed entry point right here at 4 megabytes in memory. And I'm also going to allocate and map pages like I was doing before. So for however many pages we need, the calculator, for example, takes up three blocks or three pages. So I can see that when I'm running make. Um, here it's, well, this is 18 sectors, but if I go down here, the calculator is three blocks. That's the same as pages, a block size 4K. So it'll be three pages. So this will go through three times. I'll make a, a page here. I'm going to allocate a physical block of memory for that page. And then I'm going to map an offset from the entry point according to which page we're, we're on for the file. I'm going to map that as a virtual address to the physical address we got here. Otherwise, we're out of memory. If we could map it, I'm going to get that page inside of the page table and the page directory, the current setup in the MMU. And I'm going to set it as readable and writable. I'm not sure I have to do this, but I figure it'll help for malloc and things that might prevent some odd page faults and stuff later. If I just set it explicitly, we can read and write to it. So later on, I would probably want to do like write X or execute, but I don't know how to do that right now. So we'll just do that there. And how do I load it to the entry point? That's also something I forgot and had to remember. I was like, why isn't it working? Um, I have a load file function I made recently. So that'll load. It'll take in all the extents in this inode for the file, and it'll load all the data at those extents. So the data on the disk for this program, it's going to load to that entry point. And this way, we don't have to do this other load file stuff in the back. We don't have to check for bin. We already did that. Malloc, I changed. I might have had this on the last part anyway, but malloc, I changed to do the next available file virtual address instead. So it doesn't overrun the entry point. It's at, um, I think it's at one gig. It's like 4 million, not 400,000. 
in hex. So I do still want to do this, but right now this is okay until it breaks further. <laughs> so I changed, um, instead of getting the address from the file table entry, I'm saying, hey, we have a fixed entry point. That's where I'm calling the program now to get the return code. And we're gonna free up the malloc data after that, same as before, reset malloc, clear the screen, which I don't necessarily, yeah, I do need to do because I'm not redoing that, okay. And then I added, or I moved down here rather, if the entry code was negative, I'm assuming it's an error, so we print the error. So we get that, uh, I forgot, we get that up here, and if we did get an error after freeing the malloc memory, then I'm just printing that out here. So we don't need to do this for free. I'm not calling close anymore. Um, this is freeing up the program memory. Free program pages allocated. So up here we're freeing the malloc memory that's allocated. But here we're freeing the program pages that were allocated. Okay, and then after that we're done and we can loop back and I'm going to get rid of this other commented out stuff because we have the typed command for text files. So I don't need that anymore. And there we go. Kernel's almost back down to a thousand lines. That's all right. But that helps kernel or uh, the calculator and other bin files load now. I was like, yeah, I'm not at a fixed <laughs> or I am at fixed addresses now. I'm not at position independent executables anymore. So yeah, eventually maybe I'll move back to elf or something and write like an elf loader and fix up addresses. That would probably be good, especially for porting and stuff as well. But uh, yeah, so that makes files load, you know, <laughs> and to actually write it so that they load it okay. I'm going to mark that as done. Technically, I mean, the editor doesn't load, but the editor, well, the editor loads. The editor doesn't work right now. I do want to fix that uh, because it needs to work with the new, like, syscalls open and read and write and all that. So uh, let's put that here. So I remembered to do it. So fix editor by using new system calls for read. I'll just say open, open, read, write, etc. for files. It will not use the old file table system okay i'll do that but for the rest of this since i got calculator to work <laughs> at least um, i'll go ahead and show what i did to fix the graphics modes and then maybe do this but i'll probably just fix the graphics modes and call it and then i'll try to fix the thing next time and go on to maybe make directory but okay so the graphics modes and just to make sure i don't have anything left here i do in the calculator what did I do in the calculator? Oh, I changed the entry point. Yeah, I wasn't using argc or argv, but I figured the entry point should match <laughs> that because I am passing that from the kernel. So that would be good. And since it returns an integer now, this int32 value, then at the return point, I'm just saying, hey, we returned, we're all okay. We're all okay, we'll have a zero B success, we'll say. That's all I'm doing there. Set pages read and write, that is in. Okay, I have that as well. I don't remember what I did, obviously. And a shell doesn't do that. Probably need to, probably need to not, you know, close out of everything. That's all right. Okay, set pages read and write. So where is this at, write or open? This is an open. Okay, so in syscall open, When I'm allocating pages for the file initially, if I open a file, I'm setting the read-write attribute right now. I don't need to, but just in case, I'm setting the read-write attribute. So probably later I might tweak that, but that might affect some things, so I figure I'll set it here. And just to really triply make sure Yeah, we don't have that there. So other than that, I did have debugging Uh, in the terminal and in graphics, so that's how I fix the graphics things. So currently it does work for um, for lower resolutions. So if I run for like 800 by 600, 15 bits per pixel, you know, it does work now. I mean, the font's big, so it, 
it messes up there, but before it wasn't working, and it was just a black screen. Um, I think this is at the bottom. Yeah, so when I'm getting a color, because I'm assuming we're given ARGB 888 color, so 8 bits per pixel effectively. If I'm in a color space smaller than 8 bits per pixel, like 15 bits per pixel, uh, a 565 RGB layout, or even uh, 15 bits per pixel, 555, 15 or 16, 565, um, or 8 bits per pixel, technically could be like 332, but in this case, how it's emulated, 8 bits per pixel is just the VGA colors. So that's why I have that special case there. Um, but if we have less than 8 bits per pixel, Sorry, if we have greater than 8 bits per pixel, 8 bits per like color, I guess I'm trying to say. <laughs> if we have like a 565 arrangement and we don't have 8 bits per single color attribute, we have less than 32 bits per pixel, but we have more than 8 bits per pixel, then this wasn't working. So to tweak that, I'm getting the mask size from the graphics mode, the VBE mode info block, which I have at the top here. So these mask sizes and field positions, these are the bits that the color is within the, the bytes of the color. So the mask size is how many bits that color is. So a mask size of 8 would be 8 bits for the red color, a mask size of 5 would be 5 bits for the red color. So 565, 16 bit per pixel mode would be 5 for the mask size for red, 6 for green, and 5 for blue. The field position is the bit within the color that this field starts at. So if it's a 565, let's say it's Little Indian and it's RGB, blue field position would be 0, the mask size is 5 bits, the green field position would be, um, would be at 5, <laughs> 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, the green would be at 5 and go for 6 bits, and red would be at, I think, 11 and go for 5 bits. Uh, so that's what those are doing. So I'm taking... If our max is going to be 8 bits for R, G, or B, I'm saying what is the actual mask's mask size here? If red is 5, then 8 minus 5 would be 3. So I'm getting the smaller amounts, and that's an amount I'm going to shift by to convert a sort of full 8-bit color range for each one of these values to a smaller color range with a smaller number of bits, we'll say. Bad way of explaining, but that's what this is doing. So I'm getting the amount to shift if it was a full 8 bits, it's now going down to 5 bits. I need to, you know, shift over by the number to transfer 8 to 5. And then I'm going to AND it with the sort of lower range of color values that we can have. So if the mask size is 5 bits for red, one shift left by 5 will be 32, minus 1 is 31. I'm ANDing with 31. Otherwise, down here, I was sort of similarly ANDing with 255, but we can't do that. If we were moving up to 8, we would probably, in a way, and with 255 for the full range of 8-bit color values, but I have a lesser range of color values here. So I'm not explaining this well, but I'm transferring the full, somewhat of a full 24 or 32-bit color range bits per pixel into a smaller 16, 15-bit color range is what this line is doing. So I'm shifting over and I'm anding with the value that would be. So 5 bits for red can only be a value between 0 and 32. So I'm ANDing with 31, or modulo 32, if you want to think about that. Think about it like that, with the lesser number of bits. So green is 6, so it could go up to 63, 0 to 63 for 64 full colors, and 0 to 5 again for blue, if this was a 565 five RGB. Uh, compared to full 8-bit, let me do this. Put that up there. And then I'm just oring them together and returning that as the color. That helps the colors work. So the other changes I needed to make that work was in the terminal file. And before, I was just setting 4 bits at a time whenever I was clearing the screen or whenever I was drawing a character. I was just setting a full 4 bits, assuming 32 bits per pixel. In some situations, that left like a black line on the side where it overran if it was a lesser bits per pixel range. So if it was 16, it was still writing two extra bytes of zeros, which is not good. And that was kind of a visual bug that I've had for a while. So what this does is a simple, <laughs> just an if check. Maybe it could be a switch. Maybe it could be a better, like a jump table or something later. I don't know. But if we have greater than two bytes per pixel, so 24, 32 bits per pixel, true color, whatever you want to call it, 
uh, would have three or four bytes. So if it's greater than two, I'm just saying, hey, it's probably 888 RGB. It's not guaranteed, but I'm assuming it is for this. And we can set the full four bytes. If it's two, a 16-bit per pixel mode or a 15-bit per pixel mode, you'll have two bytes per pixel. So I'm setting two bytes at a time, else I'm setting one byte at a time. And that's all I'm doing there. And I'm doing the same thing down where I'm drawing a character after I get the font character to draw. I'm doing the same thing. Before it was only this line to set four bytes at a time. Now I'm setting four, two, or one for the foreground and the background color. That's all this is doing now. That changed. And other than that, I don't think I had a, a debug marker, but... I was going to say, other than that, I did it within clear screen, but I remembered, yeah, I'm using the escape, which uses that terminal right, so never mind. So that's all I did there. And that ensures that we can use lower bits per pixel values. So we can do 1280 by 720 at 15 bits per pixel. Uh, we didn't find that. Let's try... I forget which ones we can do. They're not all available. We can do 16 bits per pixel, and it still works reasonably well. Graphics test will be broken. <laughs> That's all right. We could do 640 by 480, which is going to be small. I can't really see it. 640 by 480 at 8 bits per pixel. I mean, this will work. I have it as just green and black. And that stuff there. So that fixes the graphics modes and all. I do want to change that um, as well in the change colors command. So that would be good. Maybe I'll do that later, because that the, the change colors currently assumes a 32 bits per pixel value, so you still have to type in, you know, a 32 bit version of the color you want, even if you're in a lesser bits per pixel mode. So I do want to change that, but right now it's not top priority. So <laughs> as long as the colors work right now, we're okay. Um, so yeah, bug fixes galore, of course, after way too much debugging, but hopefully it's not too bad of a, a video here. Um, I'll probably go on next video, yeah, to just change the syscalls if it doesn't break everything. And I'll try to fix the editor, at least to write new text files, we'll say. I'll say that'll be my goal, because <laughs> that's what it used to be able to do. Write new text files, possibly write new binary files, and then we could run them from the kernel. If you write valid assembly or what have you, valid machine code into it, because I don't have an assembler or a compiler or anything yet, but... Um, yeah, I'll try to get the editor to write files again using the new syscalls. If it doesn't take too much work, I do want to redo the whole editor anyway and make it more maybe line oriented like ed or vi or some, you know, better version than what it is right now. Uh, but yeah, and if that goes smooth enough, I'll try to change the syscalls. I'll try to move on to a make and change directory command, which I think I have most of the logic laid out here. And we can go on from there. So hopefully this wasn't too bad. My voice is dying. <laughs> so I'm going to... I'm going to head off here and get something to eat and all that. Um, hope you enjoyed. And I appreciate people watching. And, you know, as always, cheers.